Today's reading is taken from Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 19. Saul in Damascus and Jerusalem. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who caused havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and were strengthened. Living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, uh, as you sit, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way you were with Saul, the Apostle Paul, and protected him in these difficult times he faced. Lord, we pray that you would be with us in these difficult times, and we pray that you would speak to us this morning by the power of your Spirit and through your Word. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, it's said that there's no one more zealous against smoking than an ex-smoker. And as I read these words from Luke's Gospel, as we heard Crispin read them, uh, describing Saul after his uh, conversion, I wonder if there's nobody more zealous for Jesus than somebody who is trying to arrest and persecute Christians. It seems that Saul, or Paul as he would go on to be called, is too hot to handle. He's even more zealous than the apostles in Jerusalem. Ironically, it's Saul who at the end of chapter 7 is a witness to the stoning of Stephen. At the beginning of chapter 8, he began to destroy the church, Luke tells us. He went from house to house, dragging off men and women and putting them in prison. And we're told that he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples at the beginning of chapter 9. Now he has people wanting to kill him, wherever he goes. Saul's an outcast, he's untouchable both in Damascus and Jerusalem. Uh, they implement very different kinds of social distancing to the social distancing we're experiencing at the moment. This is not uh, two metres apart, this is get him out of the town completely, as far away as possible uh, from where we are. In Damascus, to avoid uh, the roadblocks and the checks at the city gates, uh, they lower him uh, from a window out uh, and down the city wall for him to escape in the middle of the night. In Jerusalem, they put Saul on a ship bound for his hometown of Tarsus to get rid of him, to get him as far away from Jerusalem as possible. It's only good old Barnabas who's not afraid. Living up to his nickname, he's given at the end of Acts chapter 4, uh, son of encouragement, he vouches for Saul and takes him to meet the apostles. It's a fascinating passage for many reasons, but particularly because it's one of the few bits of the history of the early church in Acts where we have a number of different accounts. In fact, we have two accounts of this in Acts itself, in this chapter in Acts, 9 to, in Acts chapter 9, but also in Acts 22. And Paul refers to it in several of his other letters as well. He talks about uh, how he was arrested in Jerusalem, or oh, sorry, when he's arrested in Jerusalem uh, and speaks to the crowd, he talks about it. And when he writes to the churches in Corinth 
and in Galatia, he mentions this. Each time, uh, slightly different things are said to make a slightly different point. We discover that the many days uh, in verse 23 of our reading actually is three years, according to Galatians chapter 1. The apostles in Jerusalem in verse 27, we might assume, are the 12 disciples. But actually, we discover that it was just Peter uh, and James's, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, or the half-brother of Jesus, are the only two apostles he meets in Jerusalem. And whilst it appears in verses 30 and 31 that the Christians in Jerusalem can't wait to get rid of Saul, put him on that ship and get him out the way. Give us a quiet life. Actually, it's not like that at all. We find out from Paul's own mouth in Acts chapter 22 when he's speaking to the crowd in Jerusalem when he's been arrested, that actually it was God who wanted Paul to leave Jerusalem. When I returned to Jerusalem, Paul says to the crowd, and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately. Before, because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. The Lord had said to me, Paul says, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. I don't think the new spring in the step of the church in verse 31 is because Saul has been sent away. It's not, oh, phew, that's over, we can rest. No, I think something else is going on here. I think this is Luke bringing this section of the book to a close. Uh, in Greek, in the New Testament Greek, which the Bible was originally written in, there's no punctuation, there are no paragraph marks, there's no headings or chapters as we have in the Bible today, not even lowercase letters. It's just one continuous stream of all uppercase letters. And so it was writers tried to show where um, sections beginning and end, begin, begun and ended, uh, they have different ways of doing it. Uh, think of Shakespeare. Uh, go back to your days at school and, and think back about Shakespeare plays. He was writing at a time when theatres didn't have curtains, they had hardly any sets uh, which would indicate a change of scene. So Shakespeare used rhyming cutlets to indicate the end of a sentence. Uh, sometimes it was to sum up the scene, sometimes it was to give us a hint of what was going to come in the next part of the play. And here in this summary statement from Luke in verse 31, uh, we have the equivalent of Shakespeare's rhyming couplet. It draws to a close this section of the book, the gospel going to the Jews. In first chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Jesus talks about the gospel going to Jerusalem, Galilee, Samaria and the ends of the earth. And here Luke is saying the gospel has gone to Judea, Galilee and Samaria. And he hints about what's to come. Paul has got on a ship and headed to the, uh, Tarsus, uh, sorry, headed to Tarsus. He's taking the gospel to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth, as we will see in the rest of Acts as we go along over the next few weeks. And so as this section of the book closes, it's a good time to pause and to take stock. We could draw similarities between Paul's uncertain future at this point, or Saul's uncertain future, and our uncertain future with COVID-19. We could think about how Paul's life was in danger and how the lives of those suffering in hospital at this time is in danger. Or we could look at that sigh of relief in verse 30 and think about what life will be like for us after lockdown when this is all over. But actually I don't want to do any of those things this morning. I think it's very easy, especially at the moment, to look at the Bible and focus on us, to look at us and uh, where we are and what it says to us. Now, don't get me wrong, that's good and right and proper, but it's only half of the story. And so this morning, very briefly, rather than looking at us in this story, I want to look at God. We mustn't forget that whilst God speaks to us through the Bible, he also reveals himself to us through scripture and tells us about him. It's so easy in this passage to read all about Paul and what was going on in his life and how he was escaping these death threats to miss God. If you're following in a Bible at home, look at verse 20 and 22 of Acts chapter 9. Once he, that Saul, began to preach, sorry, at once he, Saul, began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. 
And then in verse 22, Saul proved that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, Jesus wasn't just some wise teacher. He wasn't a holy man. He wasn't a spiritual advisor. He wasn't simply a good moral teacher. He was and is God. He is God incarnate, God made man, God in human flesh. It's the first time in Acts that Luke tells us this. Paul has understood it. That's why he's turned his whole life upside down. Do you remember last week when he was on the road to Damascus and met the risen Lord Jesus? He had been going out breathing murderous threats against Christians. And three days later, there he is preaching in the synagogues. The very thing he set out to arrest people for. There's a a beautiful irony there, isn't there? Today, some people wonder whether Jesus really existed. If that's you, I encourage you to come and join our Alpha course in the autumn. I'm not quite sure uh, how it will work yet, whether we'll all be together or we'll, we'll be doing it online with Zoom, but do join us if you would like to. Saul, though, has no doubt that Jesus existed. He was a real person. I expect he was part of a crowd there shouting crucify to Pilate. He may even have witnessed Jesus being crucified himself. What Saul, or later Paul, didn't believe until he met him on the road to Damascus, was that Jesus had risen from the dead. It was only when he encountered him he believed. In the words of the centurion who crucified Jesus, that this man was the Son of God. The question for us this morning, the question for you this morning, is do you believe that this man Jesus was and is the Son of God? And if you do, what are you going to do about it? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way you encountered Paul on the road to to Damascus. Lord, we thank you for the way you spoke to him. We thank you uh, for his changed life, his life turned upside down. We thank you that he was willing to risk his life for you because he believed that Jesus was and is the Son of God. Lord, for those who believe it, help us to live it out in our lives. And Lord, for those of us who are struggling to believe it, would you come by your Spirit, open our eyes and our hearts, that we may see that this man was and is the Son of God. Amen. Well, friends, we're going to sing again at our contemporary service. We're going to sing of that empty cross, our risen Saviour, are victorious and strong in the song Look Inside the Mystery and at the traditional service we're going to sing uh, the wondrous story of Christ who died for me. <laughs> 